introduction. <clears throat> really a great uh, a pleasure uh, to uh, be with you and, and really you should be very proud of uh, the, the Historical Society here in Michigan. It's one of the best in the country. One only needs to uh, uh, hear that long list of activities uh, to see how vibrant the JHSM has been and is a really a model uh, for other uh, local Jewish historical societies. I've also learned much uh, from your publications. <clears throat> now, anyone who goes into an American synagogue today um, pretty well knows they can sit anywhere where uh, uh, seats are free. Um, we may know someone has a customary seat where which they prefer. There are even some older synagogues where you can find names on seats, but except for the high holidays, which are a different story, in almost every American synagogue across the spectrum of Jewish life, uh, free seating, as we call it, <clears throat> is the rule, meaning that seats are unassigned. But that wasn't true in most synagogues of the past. Um, if you go all the way back, Jewish legal codes presume that, uh, that Jews attend synagogues where seats are assigned and somewhat stratified. By stratified, I mean the best, the richest, uh, the most important sit up front, other people um, uh, less prestigious uh, sit behind them. In other words, most synagogues into early America, um, like most churches, mapped societies in equalities. And what I want to talk about today is how that changed and uh, how uh, Detroit uh, uh, played a very big role in Jewish life in making that change happen. But before we do, I did want to make clear just how prevalent uh, it was in churches and synagogues that uh, the, 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 the house of worship was stratified. So listen to the, just the first lines of this poem from colonial America dealing with a church. In the goodly house of worship, we're in order, do and fit, as by public vote directed, classed and ranked, the people sit. It goes on from there, but you get the idea. Classed and ranked. And in both churches and synagogues, there was actually a seating committee in an earlier time. It ranked the seats. Everyone was assigned their, quote, proper place. And that proper place often mirrored their place in society. I knew that would happen. Um, uh, if you go and look at the early history of Sheriff Israel in New York, you find that the wealthiest family in New York, the Gomez family, uh, they were very important traders, um, they enjoyed the most prestigious seats because they paid the highest assessments to uh, Sheriff Israel, what we would today call the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. And other people paid less and they would sit much further away from the holy ark. In Judaism, proximity to the Aron Kodesh, to the holy ark, is what determined often whether a seat was prestigious or not. Now, later on, you find that synagogues, including Sherith Israel, after the American Revolution, 
instead of assigning seats that seemed um, so undemocratic, they began a system of leasing seats. And that's actually what you had in Detroit in the early days. The good thing about leasing is that anyone can buy whatever seat they want as long as they can afford it. But in practice, of course, it was no different. The best seats went for the highest price, and therefore synagogue seating still reflected economic stratification in the community. It's often nice for historians. You look at an old seating chart, and you know who was rich, who was poor, who was prestigious, and so on. Uh, but uh, it didn't look very democratic. And it certainly looked very different uh, from today. Um, now, I don't blame synagogues and churches for the existence of inequality in America, um, nor was it, I think, unique to people in those days that they made donations of urgently needed funds. Remember, in America, churches and synagogues are not supported by the state, and so you depend on free will gifts, well, uh, people wanted conspicuous rewards in social status in return um, uh, for those gifts. Nevertheless, the intrusion of social and class distinctions into the hallowed domains of sacred institutions like synagogues troubled lots of Americans, especially those who interpreted our country's democratic ideals in egalitarian terms. If everyone's equal, why do the rich have better seats than the poor? And really, right after the beginning, right after the American Revolution, you begin to see resistance to stratified seating. It first emerges on the frontier, and you can see it, let's say, in Methodist churches, in disciples churches. They begin to experiment with this new plan, free seating on a first-come, first-served basis. Uh, you also see that idea in other kinds of institutions. Uh, many visitors to America are astonished that when you went into an American railroad car, um, rich and poor sat together, and it was pretty well first come, first served. That wasn't the way it was in stratified Europe. Or the public schools, rich and poor, brought everyone together in one place. Um, but it took quite a long time before that idea uh, really moved through American religion. And uh, it's really after the Civil War in the era that uh, Christian historians refer to as the social gospel era. Jews didn't use the term social gospel. They said, tended to call it uh, social justice. Um, but in the social gospel era of the late 19th century, that's where we see new emphasis on the idea that rich and poor are all equal uh, before God. And uh, you find it especially in immigrant churches. Poor immigrants, there was a sense uh, that just because they couldn't uh, afford to pay much, uh, they should still um, be invited into the house of worship. And there's more and more talk about what they used to call free seating. And as often the case, when you see it um, in neighboring churches, you begin to hear it in synagogues as well. So where um, uh, immigrants settled, especially New York, Baltimore, Chicago, uh, and, and immigrant Jews couldn't afford to, set, to attend synagogues, 
there were people who called out, couldn't we create uh, synagogues without any dues where everybody just sits where they like uh, for these immigrants? Not surprisingly, synagogue trustees, they were the people who had to make sure that ends meet in the synagogue, that uh, it stays afloat, uh, that all the bills are paid. They balked at this idea. Um, uh, and the other people who were very reluctant to see it happen were wealthier synagogue members. They wanted a seat with their own name on it. It would be there waiting for them, even if they came late. And some of them wanted to make sure that if their families came, they would have uh, seats all together. They wouldn't be divided up. And so over and over, we see that proposals to abandon the system of assigning seats, even when they were put forward, they generally failed. Until we come to Bethel, Temple Bethel in Detroit, and its story really brings about a change in this whole pattern, uh, a change uh, that, that whose implications we still live with today. Now, you have to remember that Detroit was growing at an enormous rate at the turn of the century. Um, it's industrializing, there are lots of jobs, people are moving in. And um, there's also immigration, that's, of course, in part why uh, Bethel builds this brand new building. You can still see it on Woodward Street. Uh, we were talking before that synagogue on Woodward Street, the temple, was uh, designed by a then very young, uh, later a world famous industrial architect uh, named Albert Kahn. Uh, they built a synagogue. They open the synagogue, and no sooner do they open it, they discover it's too small to accommodate everyone who wants to join. It's brand new. They're very proud of it. It's very beautiful. But the temple at that time was growing at the astonishing rate of 25% a year. I'm not sure there are many uh, temples and synagogues in America today that uh, grow at 25% a year, but Bethel did in 1903. And there was just no way that they could assign seats equitably to all the members and their families. There weren't enough seats, and having just built a new building, they didn't know what to do. Um, so um, uh, then they realized that even though they couldn't sell all the seats to people who wanted them, on any given Saturday, there were lots of empty seats. They may have had names on them, but they didn't have bodies on them. Even then, lots of Jews didn't show up every Saturday. There was plenty of room. Um, uh, and uh, as a result, since they couldn't solve the problem of how to sell so many seats uh, to a much larger group that wanted to buy the seats, they voted that until they figured out a good solution, they voted in September of 1903, that they would leave the seats temporarily unassigned every Saturday, Friday night, Saturday, first come, first serve. And this worked very well. And uh, they charged the trustees with figuring out what to do going forward. It's worth remembering that this is a pragmatic, not an ideologically motivated decision. This will solve the problem. Uh, the uh, Nobody, I think, expected that this temporary measure 
of leaving all the seats unassigned, first come, first served, would have a lasting effect. But uh, sometimes these kinds of decisions do end up having a much larger impact than people imagine. And uh, that's what happened at Beth L. Now, until uh, this time, the rules of Beth L had been rather complicated, but you could buy a seat if you were rich. <clears throat> Seats were expensive, but it would be yours in perpetuity. There were actually people who took out mortgages to have a chair that would be theirs in the temple or you could rent a seat. Um, and again, the better the seat, the higher the rent. Or if you were poor, you would have a seat assigned to you from the pool of seats that remained after they were done selling them and renting them. And there were some additional levies and um, it was a rather cumbersome and deeply inequitable system. Lots of members didn't like the system, but it had the great advantage of keeping the temple afloat and paying the rabbi's salary and covering all of the things that congregations need to cover in their budget. Um, the trustees, after figuring seeing the problem uh, in Woodward Street were very reluctant to abandon this old system. And their first thought was, let's somehow try to sell seats and rent them and use the old system, um, the good old paradigm, it worked, uh, that way we'll meet our budget. But it's a rare case, doesn't happen too often, and rabbis know when it does happen, it's bad news. The congregants rebelled. They didn't want to go back to the old system. Uh, whenever you read in the minutes that there was a vigorous debate, you can be sure uh, that that's a euphemism for lots of opposition. Um, and um, uh, people wanted to have meetings. Some said, well, let only people who can buy seats have seats. Um, and some people said, no, 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 no. Um, uh, let's let everybody uh, sit, treat everybody equally. Um, they had all sorts of meetings, and as long as they were still meeting on the subject, they kept free sitting first come, first served um, uh, going. And finally, uh, six months later, uh, when none of the other proposals won approval from the membership, uh, the new status quo of free seating, no assigned seats, first come, first served, finally was made permanent. Uh, the unassigned pew system was unanimously concurred in by those present at a large and enthusiastic meeting of the congregation. It's really fascinating wording, and you see how an idea that seemed threatening six months afterwards, once they went through the process, and they talked about all the other possibilities, and they argued and so on, they figured out that what they had been doing um, uh, was exactly what they needed to do. They raised the assessment to pay for lost revenue, and um, uh, suddenly uh, Bethel, sort of by accident, um, uh, becomes the very first major synagogue in the United States uh, to, to introduce free seating. Um, and uh, proponents very rapidly uh, begin to make a virtue of this necessity. This is very common in Jewish life. Um, they talk about how their new method evidences Judaism's concern 
for justice, equality, fraternity. And indeed, uh, the very uh, well-known and intelligent um, a rabbi of Bethel in those days, Rabbi Leo Franklin, who I suspect had sort of feared things and had allowed uh, things to work out. So eventually the congregation came to that unanimous decision. He now casts himself in American Jewish life as uh, the apostle of free seating, trumpeting the system's virtues defending them against all critics. He calls free seating essentially Jewish, as nearly ideal as human institutions can be. And in, in his most famous line quoted uh, all over, he says, in God's house all must be equal. There must be no aristocracy and no snobocracy. You won't find the word snobocracy in your dictionary, but I suspect you can figure out what it means. And he becomes a deep critic of those uh, who think that, uh, that contributors who are richer and give more to the synagogue should uh, get disproportionate rewards. Uh, he insists that uh, experience in Detroit demonstrates that even under the unassigned system, in real life, the regulars occupy the same seats year round Without assigned seating, they come all the time. They sit in the same seat. I know, I go to a, a synagogue, same thing happens. People, and by the way, it's also true in a university classroom. After three weeks, all the students sit in the same seats. Not that I sell them the seat, but that's human nature. And um, that's what happened at, at Beth Al as well. And he said, that uh, not only did the new system introduce equality, but it had another benefit, which is that it encouraged people to come to the temple on time and bring their families. Because if they came at the very end, then they in fact might not be able to get a bunch of seats together. So they knew they had to come earlier. Um, and he said, that the system at Beth El had once and for all put an end to the abomination, which went on all the time in the 19th century, uh, of ha abomination is his words, of having rented seats unoccupied while dozens of poor men and women are compelled to stand in the aisle or lobbies. In other words, in the old days, you couldn't sit at a chair where they had someone else's name on it. So they would sit in the lobby or in the aisle, um, and guests often couldn't be seated in the congregation, which was very embarrassing. All those problems were solved by the new system of uh, free uh, seating. So not surprisingly, uh, with him as a major rabbi, pro as a proponent of the system, and based on his experience um, in Detroit, we see many other congregations begin to talk about these ideas as, as an expression of social justice. In other words, no longer do they say, oh, this is a good pragmatic solution to a problem. Now, it's ideologically what we should do because we believe in it. Um, the famous uh, social justice rabbi, Emil G. Hirsch of Chicago, uh, he calls it the ideal plan. All synagogues should adopt it. Uh, Henry Berkowitz, uh, another very famous uh, reform rabbi in Philadelphia, he recommends it. And Leo Franklin's papers are filled with letters from other rabbis interested in watching 
the experiment. Can we really maintain the temple financially without um, a stratifying and selling the seats? Uh, uh, and and uh, can we do it by allowing everyone to sit uh, freely? Uh, the younger rabbi who was most interested, I can't tell his story, but I'll just mention, Stephen S. Wise is probably the most famous rabbi who pays attention. Um, and he is going later to found a, a synagogue in New York, and there are other synagogues on that model where everything is free. In other words, it's not just that you can sit wherever you want, um, but there are no fixed dues, there's complete freedom of the pulpit, there's total freedom of opportunity for anybody to become a member and office holder, and those synagogues are known as free synagogues. If you go to New York, <clears throat> you can go to this day to the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue, but they probably don't know that the term originally went back to free seating uh, here in Detroit at <laughs> Beth L. Um, and, and Stephen Wise just um, uh, expanded on it. And he talked a lot about how valuable the idea was, leveling of the anti-religious bars of ass. He said, I can't quite imitate uh, Stephen Wise, but you can hear his raspy voice uh, talking about how the idea that rich and poor should be seated in different places was to him the antithesis of um, what Judaism should, should do. Now, I have to say that Stephen Wise's idea worked okay at the Free Synagogue, very interestingly, in our own time, there's been a big revival of this idea uh, that, that uh, congregations should allow uh, people to pay uh, whatever dues they, they want to pay and can afford, move away from fixed dues. But at least at the beginning of the 20th century, most of the other congregations that tried uh, the system that Stephen Wise proposed, making everything free and voluntary and let people pay as they want, that did not work. They just couldn't raise enough money to pay the bills. And we can see several congregations uh, that, that tried it um, and um, and then, uh, and then backed away from it. But what Beth L did, which was much more limited, yeah, you still have to pay, but you can sit freely. You pay dues, but you can, after you pay dues, you sit anywhere you like in the synagogue, and the earlier you come, the better the seat you get. Uh, that, uh, that, did succeed, and we see it spreading uh, all over the country quite rapidly. In Memphis, in Pittsburgh, in Boston, in Houston, by 1940, um, which um, means within one generation, uh, it's the norm, 200 synagogues have adopted it all the time, even on the high holidays, as an ideal. And most of the rest of the synagogues have adopted it all the time, except for the high holidays, uh, which is true in many, many synagogues to this day. And the high holidays are a special issue. I'm happy to talk about that um, uh, uh, in the question period. Um, and uh, you can really see how this idea is now tied in with democracy and um, becomes prevalent, fascinatingly, across the spectrum. 
this is, there are many issues in Jewish religious life where the Orthodox go one way, the Reform go another way, say mixed seating or separate seating. Not true of free seating. Free seating becomes popular across the spectrum. And today you can take a tour of different uh, synagogues and temples in Detroit and see if I'm right. But today, uh, you can go from an Orthodox synagogue to a Reform synagogue, and on the average Sabbath, you can pretty well sit in any empty chair <clears throat> if you go into uh, the synagogue. And so much so, the people are astonished to discover that it didn't used to uh, be that way. Um, now, um, uh, the, let me just um, I conclude with why all of this story is revealing and significant. Uh, first of all, it sheds light on how under American influence, the ideas of democracy and freedom and equality, synagogues actually change. And ideas that <clears throat> had um, been acceptable for hundreds, sometimes thousands of years. Synagogues, you have a right to go in there and not have to pay for your seats and things like that. It was a change. In Excuse me. Um, and um, those uh, uh, those ideas um, really. Right, I got it. He's been basically. Those ideas um, uh, under under. Um, American influence, you see the synagogue ex changes in America. Um, um, differences based on wealth became an affront from the perspective of many Jews to America's democratic ethos. Uh, and um, uh, perhaps because uh, it wasn't a matter deeply rooted in Jewish law, uh, it takes over across the spectrum, and pretty soon free seating allows the synagogue to display what we might call a kind of patriotic piety. Um, we're American, everybody's equal, and those of you who have been to European or Israeli synagogues that still do have names on chairs and are stratified know exactly what I mean. Um, um, uh, and of course, there was the added advantage, which uh, smart business people rapidly saw, which is you were using the seats far more efficiently. Previously, lots of seats sat empty. They had a name on them, but the seats sat empty. Now, the seats were used much more efficiently and uh, as efficiency becomes more and more important in American business, the idea, let's use our synagogue seats efficiently, uh, that, um, that carries great power. Um, and um, my sense is that what Rabbi Franklin does is invest free seating with deep, Jewish significance through his writings, and he makes this process of adjustment, this change, a uh, particularly easy, because by implementing free seating, as Beth L did, congregants could now view themselves not only as better Americans, but also as better Jews. So let me stop there. <clears throat> and I, I, I heard that there were uh, some questions. Um, uh, and uh, why don't we uh, uh, try and take any questions that, that you may have on, on the process. And if people have been elsewhere, want to talk about seating or have other questions on seating, I'm, I'm happy to try and tackle them as well. Again, if you all have any questions, please submit them to myself or Dr. Sarna via the chat feature and we can get them answered. <laughs>
So while we're waiting, maybe I'll explain why uh, I left out the high holidays and several times said that the high holidays were an exception. I don't know what happens at Beth L uh, on the high holidays uh, today, but uh, there are a couple of reasons for the exception on the high holidays. First of all, simply practically, on the high holidays, unlike on the Sabbath, you did have many more people um, who um, uh, wanted to come than you could possibly uh, freely accommodate. And uh, there needed to be some regulation on the high holidays. Uh, so that's important. Um, but the second factor, which um, isn't usually mentioned, in the last few decades, uh, Homeland Security has begun recommended to synagogues sell tickets on the high holidays. Because if you sell tickets, you know who is going to come. Just like on Zoom, if you uh, um, ask people to pre-register, you know who's going to come. And that's a safety measure. Um, uh, if if uh, someone signs up um, for Rosh Hashanah services whose name is Osama bin Laden, then you uh, investigate. And maybe somebody looks rather carefully when uh, this person comes. So security dictated on the high holidays also that tickets should be used and in many synagogues today, it's an exception, but in many ways, it's the exception that proves the rule. Um, uh, all the rest of the year, the seats are free in some synagogues, even on the high holidays. And um, uh, in others, what's so interesting is that the regulars really want to sit where they sit all year round. We want to sit in a regular seat on the high holidays, rather than having uh, synagogues and temples map society's inequality. Um, I have not really been in a synagogue uh, where the very wealthiest tier sit up front, and then uh, by the time you get to the back, uh, you can see that the poorest live. That's not the way our synagogues are, uh, but maybe the way our theaters are. Now we have a lot of questions, um, and let me take them one at a time. Recently, some synagogues have started to go dues free. How's that working out? Uh, actually, the 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 man who is the um, apostle of this idea is Rabbi Dan Judson, who was my student, and his book, which I highly recommend, uh, has part of this story and deals much more broadly with the way synagogues are funded. Uh, he has a, a, a good business sense, Dan Judson. He's the dean at the Hebrew College now. And that's, uh, his book is wonderful. Um, and the answer is uh, to the question uh, is uh, it's early. There have certainly been congregations that are thrilled by the dues-free system. It's not dues-free. What that the system usually is, um, you pay whatever you want, but we will share with you our costs, and we will announce that uh, you know uh, our costs are a uh, million dollars. Uh, we have a hundred members unless every member pays a thousand dollars, we won't have ends meeting. Um, so it may be that uh, wealthier members will pay more to let poor members pay less. It's worked out in some congregations, but I was interested to learn that Emmanuel of San Francisco abandoned the system. It just wasn't working for them. Um, if you come back in 50 years, will sort of know, uh, did it work? Did it not work? I suspect it will work in some places uh, where it has allowed 
uh, unemployed or poor people, people who lost their job during the pandemic, to say, look, uh, I can only afford $100 this year. Uh, I want to be part of the temple, and there's no shame to it. Um, but in other places where you have too many freeloaders, uh, it's not likely to work. Um, all right, um, and now I got to figure out how I go down. Uh, was there a significant difference in the revenue generated by seat purchase versus membership when the transition were made? Well, the great thing about seat purchase, and that's what they loved in the 19th century, is that you could fund the whole synagogue the day it opened. Meaning, let's say I took out a big mortgage in order to build my synagogue on Woodward, uh, on Woodward Avenue. Um, uh, I, um, uh, I would, um, sell the seats before the synagogue opened. I'd hold a big auction, and I would be able to take that money straight to the bank, pay off the, the mortgage. The synagogue would open debt free. And that was a big deal. Temple Emmanuel, when it opened, was debt free. That enormous uh, building in New York because of that system. But of course, it meant that the synagogue um, was very beholden to its wealthiest members. Um, when the transition was made, of course, Bethel by then had already been built and paid for, and they figured it out in such a way that people, uh, that, that they were breaking even, and that was what they were so proud of. But most synagogues built in the 20th century knew that they would have to take a mortgage and they would pay it off over many years rather than uh, paying it off on day one by selling seats. Um, but they thought that that trade-off was worthwhile. Uh, were there any legal ramifications? Oh, what a great question. Uh, from seat owners who had lost seats they had paid for. That's really, a, and even I, I left out some of this story. At Beth L, there were a couple of people who wouldn't give up their seats. They wanted to own them. I mentioned it in, in the published. And wisely, I think, the trustee said, okay. Uh, Mr. Schloss wants to have his seat. Okay, he'll have his seat. We'll make an exception for him. The same thing I, in my lifetime, when I lived in Cincinnati, there was free seating um, at uh, Isaac M. Wise Temple, the very prestigious uh, uh, congregation in Cincinnati but there were maybe three very senior people who insisted they owned their seats. And so in that big cavernous place, there were three seats with little signs on them. Um, uh, and those people sat very proudly in their seat. Uh, but of course, uh, in time, the Almighty takes care of such problems. And they wouldn't um, they wouldn't sell any more seats. Uh, same in Mikveh Israel in Philadelphia to this day. There are a few people who have seats with their names on them, um, and that's how they got around it. Um, I believe that there were some court cases. Courts hate getting involved in synagogue property kinds of issues. It raises all sorts of issues of religion and state that courts hate to deal with. And for the most part, the courts have ruled that 
a synagogue or temple can make its own rules. Um, um, mo I, I did once look at it, and most of the decisions are um, uh, are in other kinds of issues. So, for example, there were synagogues that had separate seating. Mr. Cohen owns a seat in a synagogue with separate seating. Then they moved to mixed seating. Mr. Cohen took the congregation to court saying, when I bought my seat, I wanted a seat in a separate seating congregation. You have no right to change the nature of the, of the congregation uh, in such a way that I'm not comfortable and for my purposes, my seat is worthless. But actually the court threw out the case saying, uh, that by, by that logic, no synagogue or church could ever make any change. And, um, uh, you know, Mr. Cohen was free uh, to sell his seat back to the congregation. Uh, but you'd have to ask um, some of the lawyers to go through each and every case. But when I looked at it, uh, that was sort of the way it came down. Um, it's a really interesting question. Uh, let's take a look here. Um, uh, I think members tend to donate more when not confronted with a dues structure. That in fact is what Rabbi Judson, Rabbi Dr. Judson says as well, that people will donate more um, and we'll see. Um, uh, there are congregations that have tried it. Uh, there's a congregation near me that is thrilled with the new system uh, in Sharon. Uh, they think it saved their congregation. A lot of people lost jobs at a particular point. This allowed all those people to stay in the congregation and pay something. And th then later they got jobs back. They were grateful. They gave more. Um, uh, and, and so on. Um, the, uh, um, uh, my, my good friend, uh, the very distinguished Professor Mark Slobin, I hope he doesn't mind that I read it, he writes properly, this is so typical of Detroit, a dynamic pragmatism drove the rapid commercially based explosive growth, including Khan's architecture. In other words, the idea, it's a very good point, the idea of pragmatism was uh, driving the city and therefore it drove the congregation to take a pragmatic uh, solution. Uh, and he then goes on and asks, are there effort, uh, are there echoes of German-Russian internal conflict. I didn't see them for the simple reason, I think, that in this early period, the Russians were not coming to Bethel, meaning newer East European Jews um, were not terribly attracted to the kind of worship that Leo Franklin, by then a classical reform rabbi, was holding at Beth El, and most of the histories of the Jews of Detroit argue, no, they were, if they were going to synagogues, they were going to Orthodox synagogues, or uh, if they weren't going to synagogue, the synagogue they weren't going to was Orthodox, as Bella Abzug used to say. Um, and I think it's only later that you begin to see some of those tensions at classical reform congregations. Now we have another uh, question. Were the sale of seats permanent for a one-time fee or did they get renewed every year to pay operating expenses? The way it worked really is the way a condominium works, same idea. You would buy the seat in perpetuity but you had to pay an annual maintenance fee for the seat. And that's how the economics worked. And the amount of money you paid in perpetuity paid off the building, 
and the maintenance fee paid for the maintenance uh, of the congregation. So it was really very much like a condominium. There were differences. I don't know if anyone has studied it. There were places where the seats literally were part of your estate and could be passed on to future generations. That was uncommon for the simple reason that it caused no end of trouble. Uh, maybe the next generation didn't want the seat, or maybe they moved away, but they owned the seat and they said, it's my seat. Doesn't matter that I'm never gonna occupy it in my life. Don't dare let anybody else sit there. Um, and that may be good law, but it didn't help synagogues that wanted to fill um, the seats that were there. So most of the synagogues I've looked at um, insisted that when you passed away, the seat would either revert back to the synagogue or the synagogue would buy it for the same price you paid for it which of course, owing to inflation was uh, different. There are many, many cases where in practice, when Mr. Cohen passed away, he would jet or he or his heirs would simply donate the seat back to the congregation. And that's what really happened. But, uh, you know, as I say, that really needs, uh, if someone's interested to look carefully at uh, at different um, at different synagogues and what they did. I also know of synagogues where they came to a compromise. You can still see it, where Mr. Cohen's name would remain on the seat, but anybody could sit there, and that was kind of you know in perpetuity it would be known as the Cohen seat, uh, but it wasn't empty. Uh, so that that worked in some places. Um, uh, was there any conflict between rabbis and congregants with regard to the change? Well, you know, rabbis are always unhappy when there's conflict. And another way to tell the story, if I were teaching it in a rabbinical school, would be how it seems to me Rabbi Franklin rather cleverly managed this conflict. Uh, he let the trustees vote, we're going to keep the old system. And then when congregants made a big ruckus and complained, he called meeting and another meeting and another meeting. And there were votes and eventually people came to a consensus. This sounds uh, almost un-American coming to a consensus in a divided America, it's hard to imagine a process that would bring people to consensus. But before the day before yesterday, um, that happened a lot. And uh, we, we were proud of people uh, who were able to bring about consensus after a lot of back and forth and argument and so on. That's how our constitution was written read the um, uh, convention and that on uh, many town meetings worked that way and many synagogues did. So my sense is that uh, sure, it's much easier for a rabbi when there's no conflict, but actually I don't know of any synagogues that are conflict free. That's only, uh, you know, in the synagogue in heaven. Uh, in synagogues on, in America, there are always conflicts. Good rabbis know how to manage them. And it wasn't so much rabbis and congregants, it was congregants versus other congregants. And um, smart, a smart rabbi, very well trained, um, uh, understood how to bring them together so that eventually, and I'm sure that's why the minutes had that quote that I read you, they eventually came uh, to um, unanimity. Um,
Uh, some, uh, uh, okay. Um, I think we're out of time. Um, uh, how did, oh, uh, there's one more. Let me try and get it. How did it work for children? Could they get seats near their children? Again, you have to look at synagogue after synagogue. Some synagogues actually had pews, meaning like churches with pews. So your synagogues kind of sat with you, even some closed end pews, and that was easy. Um, other places made all sorts of arrangements uh, for children. There were plenty of places that banned children until they were 10 or even sometimes a little older. That was a terrible idea if any of you don't like children. It turns out that if you ban the children until they're grown up, they may never come back. And um, uh, I don't know any synagogue anymore uh, that bans children until they're grown ups, but it was quite common. Um, and there were also synagogues, you can still see them in Europe, uh, where children sat in a special section uh, uh, and they would have people whose job it was to discipline the children uh, uh, in the synagogue. Again, didn't inspire love of Judaism or the synagogue on the part of those children. It didn't really uh, continue in America, but there is a description of it in Boston, in Temple Israel, uh, Rabbi Rabinovich writes a, a, a description of how the children were separate and they'd be disciplined and he put an end to the system, uh, which is probably why Temple Israel still survives and thrives today. Uh, otherwise, I suspect uh, it wouldn't have. But more, a, a good book could be written on the place of children in the history of American synagogues. Not enough work uh, has uh, been done on that subject, but I'm afraid it will have to be another day uh, because our time is up. So thank you for listening and thank you for wonderful questions. And now back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarno. We really, really appreciate it. We want to thank all of you who Zoomed in today. We have um, an audience that includes people from Israel and from out of state as well. So um, we really appreciate everyone uh, tuning in. And we hope to see you all again very soon at some of our upcoming programs.